Uh, welcome to another uh, session of Meetup Live. You're attending the Meetup Community Building Office Hours. Uh, I am uh, one of our community support team leads. My name is Alex. I'm joined here by our Director of Operations from the Community Support Team. This is Colin. We'll be answering your questions today. Uh, before we dive into answering those questions, giving you a heads up on what you can expect today. Um, as always, this event will be recorded. You do not appear in the video and your audio is automatically muted during the event. Um, see uh if you have questions throughout the presentation today we have a q and a feature we have some support specialists uh on the line to answer your questions in real time if we have time at the end of our presentation we might answer some of those q and a questions aloud so p please feel free to share those questions with us and uh, closed captioning is available if you'd like to turn that on just click the live transcription icon at the bottom of your screen and select your preference um, once I get done introducing everybody to our presentation today, Colin and I will address uh, several questions that were submitted to us in the form in the meetup event before we got started today. Um, and at the very end of the presentation, after we've answered your questions, we'll share some resources and links so that you have access to the community support team to follow up if anything else comes up as you are continuing to use meetup. Um, what you will learn today, uh, we're going to learn about who pays for a meetup group and what uh, access and privileges that paid subscription gives you. We'll be talking about what makes Meetup Pro special, the unique features that are available for Meetup Pro admins uh, who are hosting a network of meetup groups. Uh, you'll find where you can find resources for hosting events, say if you've got people who are just joining your leadership team and are looking for those resources on how they are supposed to manage that event, we'll point you in the right direction. Um, we'll answer when you can collect funds for your ticketed events, how often those deposits are made into your account and how you can set that up. We'll talk about which video tools are available for online events um, in, in addition to Zoom as well as Zoom. Um, and we'll learn why your members may not receive certain emails, a huge question we often get. We'll talk you through some of the common solutions for that problem. And uh, we'll also talk about how you can remove inactive members, uh, trying to create a healthy member list of people who are actively engaged with your group is a hugely important uh, issue for a lot of our organizers. So we'll talk you through how to do that. Like I said, the Q&A feature is open. Uh, the, uh, it's in your Zoom window. Feel free to submit questions throughout our presentation today. We will be answering them live as you go. We'll try to get through everything. And uh, I think that takes us to the meat and potatoes of our presentation today. We're going to get started on questions that you submitted. So first and foremost, um, we got an interesting question from someone asking if there was an illustrated how-to for event hosts who only occasionally have to work out how to set up or administrate an event. So uh, a couple of terms I want to specify before we dive in. An event host um, is a general member of your group that you can select to host one event. It's like an occasional role that you can assign. It's not an official part of your leadership team. So it's not someone who has any sort of administrative privileges uh, for your group outside of the one event where you've assigned them the role of event host. Because it's such an infrequent assignment, it's entirely possible that these event hosts don't know the procedures for hosting. Um, so we want to take you through some of the resources that are available. Uh, first and foremost, we have something in our blog called the Organizer Guide. And I've linked here to um, the link, uh, I'm sorry, to the uh, blog article that takes you through what to do at your first meetup event. Now, the question was asking for illustrated how-to guides. And we don't have illustrations in this particular article, but we do have helpful lists and bullet points that sort of break down bit by bit what you can expect uh, when you are hosting an event. And I think this is a really hugely helpful resource for people who are just getting started hosting their own events. Um, another thing to keep an eye out for is our help center. The help center does have more illustration. Um, this Help Center article, for instance, is on our new event check-in feature. This was a highly requested feature for organizers. It's available in the Meetup for Organizers app. And this illustrated GIF here uh, in its animation will demonstrate how you can use it. So we have some of those more animated walkthroughs for the actual features of Meetup itself. Um, 
go back into the slideshow here for everybody. So we've got the organizer guide and we've got the help center. Um, if you would like a more detailed tutorial about hosting events, we were talking about it before the event. We think it's a great idea. Um, so uh, we think that's a great idea to request, like as a feature request, either build directly into Meetup or that we can set up in the blog or in the help center. So if you've got ideas for resources like this illustrated how-to guide and you're not seeing them anywhere, you can submit a feature request to our team. We'll process them. We try to make sure we can address them uh, in time with the different rollouts and updates that we make to Meetup. So we wanted to show you the process for submitting these feature requests so that you feel empowered to do so yourself. Um, so we're going to click on this submit requests button right here. You could also scan that QR code I had on the slide. We'll have that up later in the presentation as well. So when you go to submit a feature request by following that link, it's also available on the landing page for a community support team. Um, this feature request form uh, is set up in Google. The first thing you'll do is select which part of Meetup you would like to uh, see uh, uh, a new feature for. So because we're talking about a tutorial for events, I'm going to go ahead and select events. You could just as easily select other, or if there's something specific you'd like to see an animated tutorial for or an illustrated tutorial for, you can select anything else. But let's say events. Um, now it says event feature category. You'll get another set of drop down uh, menus here. And let's say other. Um, explanation of feature requests. So we'll type in, I'd love to see an illustrated how-to manual for event hosts who are hosting their first event. You can select which platforms you prefer it for. So let's say the apps and the desktop and say, I'm an organizer. You can insert your location. Um, I'm joining us from North Hollywood, California. Um, and if you would like to receive a response back from our product team as new updates are released that address your request, you can insert that there. So that's it. Those steps, you follow them through um, and our team reviews this feature request and we do our best to address them. Um, all right, so now we are going to move on to our next question, Colin. Yeah, Alex, um, just I wanted to share just one quick thing about question one um, uh, sure. regarding um, the event scheduler. Um, we do have, and we, we talked about the organizer guide, and there is a quick link to access the organizer guide with all of the, uh, the articles, topics, categories of how to be a successful organizer. And it's right in the event scheduler. Um, on the right hand side. So when you go to create an event, um, you can see uh, it'll just it's just a, a hyperlink right out uh, to the guide. So that's a quick way to, to look at it. And there's also a couple tips um, on the right hand side as well. So just wanted to share that. Do we want to show that in the event scheduler for people Do Yeah, sure. If you just, yeah, just click create event. And right on the right hand side, we just have a couple tips there. Um, if you click get more tips in the organizer guide, it's just it um, hyperlinks right out. We have a bunch of different articles. So definitely recommend those. This article um, here is the one I've linked to in our presentation. Right. As you can see, we've got lots of other resources here for organizing basics. And we also have some more uh, complex tips from real organizers who are hosting their own events. So I want to make sure everybody yeah. has to those. Cool. All right. So question two. This one is how do I collect deposits for RSVP, RSVP events? So this sounds like um, they're asking about event fees. Now event fees is something that you can charge for each of your events. Um, sometimes, you know, there's expenses that come with hosting events such as, you know, uh, renting a venue or you might have some snacks or pizza or there's like it costs money to attend a show for a ticket. So there's many reasons why uh, you would want to charge an event fee. Um, sometimes organizers even charge like a dollar just to get people to show up uh, to their events, you know, just something small. Um, but it's, uh, it's pretty easy to collect the money once, you once people pay. Uh, we do use PayPal to collect event fees. Um, and so we have this article here for how to actually set up your PayPal account because you need to do that first before you can collect the funds. 
Um, so you'll set up your PayPal account, you'll link it to your meetup group, and then you can set a fee on your event. And when members RSVP, they're expected to pay right then and there. So they will need to pay with their credit or debit card. And when they do, then their RSVP will be confirmed and they'll be ready to go. So they won't be able to um, actually say yes to going until they RSVP. So that's a, a good uh, uh, fun function of the event fee feature. Now, um, in order to actually collect the funds from the, the ticketed event, uh, we can, you can go over to your manage money page, which is kind of in your group settings or organizer tools section. Um, it's like it's to show. Yeah, if you could show, um, this is my uh, this is my yoga group. If you go back and you can click manage, you go to your group homepage and you click manage group, and then you select manage money. This will show an overview of all things money regard uh, related to your group. Now we do have other money uh, products on Meetup. So we have member dues, we have fundraising and event fees. Uh, this right, and, and also sponsors. Um, this is uh, an overview of all of that. So um, you, can see, uh, see, you can see that I don't really charge event fees or anything uh, for my group. But if you did, you'll see an overview here. Um, and you can, um, you, can, you can kind of just see everything uh, in transactions at the bottom as well. Yeah, so hopefully that was helpful. Cool. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, if you want to go to, oh, Alex, can you show, can you go back, sorry, can you go back to um, the, the account and click uh, my profile uh, photo in the upper right? <clears throat> sure. And then we'll go to my account settings, click set, uh, settings. And I just want to show them how to set up a PayPal account. If you scroll down to payments received, You'll see, again, I haven't collected anything, but if you wanna add your PayPal account, you go right here, click add PayPal, and um, you'll in, input the email address that you use to, for your PayPal account. Now, just note that um, when you do link your PayPal, when members go to pay, they will be able to see that email address. It's just kind of how PayPal uh, identifies people. Um, so, um, but once you save your PayPal information, then you'll be able to, collect event fees from there. So that's kind of step one. Anyway, cool, hope that helps. All right, thanks, Colin. I'll tap in for our next question. Question three, how do I delete inactive or deceased members? It seems impossible to delete a member who has died and we have not heard from in years. So um, the situation of deceased members is obviously a little niche, but it does come up. Um, which is why it's useful to bring it up in these sessions, these sort of like niche things that you run into and maybe there aren't resources available or you don't have anyone else in your group who's run into the situation. Um, broadly speaking, if you're an organizer and you're aware that someone in your group will not be attending again, you can manually sort through your member list to identify active or inactive members. You can manually remove or even ban those inactive members from your group. That's a general... Um, principle to keep in mind for the overall health of your group. Um, you can sort through your member list to identify people who haven't visited lately and you can manually remove them. Um, now, if you know someone has passed away and you want their account fully deactivated, we recommend reaching out to our trust and safety team. They can guide you through the steps to verify your request and close the account uh, on that person's behalf. Um, I think what we're going to do is just give you a little glimpse into how we can sort through the member list and identify those members who haven't visited recently. So this, we're back in Colin's group. Um, this is his member list. And up here at the top, you have these sort by filters. You want to sort by last visited, which I've already selected here. Um, and it's showing the people who visited most recently, people who visited today. This up down arrow here, if you click that, it'll resort them in reverse order. So you'll see at the top people who have visited the longest time ago. You click this three dots icon here, and you can click remove from group to manually remove them. If you have a lot of members in your group 
who haven't visited recently who you'd like to remove, we recommend reaching out to our community support team. We can do a bulk removal for you. Um, that's, uh, I think, something to keep in mind about that is if you manually remove somebody, you get to send them a message, which if they're still alive and you want them to still be participating in your group and you want them to be reinvited to rejoin the group, sending that personal message is useful. But a bulk removal, on our end, we don't have the option to send a message along with a bulk removal. So some 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 tools and strategies to keep in mind. Did you want to weigh in on that, Colin? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of emphasize that it's totally okay um, to remove members at your will. Like, this is your group. You want, you, you know, if people people's circumstances change in life, and maybe they joined your group and they're interested, and maybe they've moved, or maybe they just aren't active on Meetup at the moment. Um, so, you know, just for the health of your your uh, membership, um, we definitely encourage that. And it's totally OK, uh, like no hard feelings, you know, um, and it kind of gets you uh, to focus on the members who are more engaged and more active at the moment. And they can always rejoin your group unless you choose to ban them for whatever reason. So, yeah, I just wanted to kind of share that. Great. Thank you. All right. We're going to move on to our next question. Um, All right. Yeah. Question four. This one says, if I take over a group by paying for its subscription, can the person who started it take it back and still control what I do? So this is a group. This is a great question. Um, I just want to emphasize that um, you don't when you start a meetup subscription, if you're starting a standard subscription, you don't pay per group, you actually pay to be an organizer. So when you have a subscription and a standard core subscription, you can organize up to three groups. So whether you organize one, two, or three, you're paying the same price for that standard subscription. <clears throat> now, if uh, a group was started by someone else and then you took over it, uh, maybe the organizer stepped down and asked their members to take over or maybe uh, their, you know, they, they, their group became frozen and just like was open in general to people. And you stepped up. That means that that is your group now, and you can you can continue uh, organizing events as you as you want. Um, but it's now yours, and it's it's not it's no longer the previous organizers. You'll have full control of your group settings, your membership, and events. Um, now you can always transfer the group back to the original organizer, um, but they would ne then need to pay and activate their subscription because again, you're paying to be an organizer. You're not paying specifically for the, the one group, that, that particular group. Um, but you know, another situation is you can always designate them as co-organizer organizer, or maybe they take it back over and then you become co-organizer. So it's all about, you know, there always needs to be at least one primary organizer who pays a subscription to organize the group. Um, and then you can figure out a leadership team or um, as you will. But yeah, like I said, once you take over a group, it is yours. Um, and there are rare circumstances where if you take something, take over a group that it would be given back to the organizer. But that's more of like a rare situation scenario where it was like an accident or something. So, um, and that's something that our trust and safety team uh, deals with. So anyway, yeah, just wanted to um, hope, hope that hopefully that was clear. Um, um, a couple of things we can dig into a little deeper here. I just want to point out um, our help center does have an article on how to transfer a group to another organizer. And we emphasize in this um, article as well your subscription does not transfer with the group. Like Colin said, the, you're, you're paying to be an organizer, which gives you access to lead up to three groups. So the fact that you've paid for a specific group is, is not actually how Meetup is set up. You're paying to be an organizer who can host up to three groups. Um, so to learn more about the process, there's sort of two different sides of this. There's the former organizer who's transferring the group and the new organizer who is accepting the group. Each of them can have uh, their own subscription and managing that can get a little confusing. This help center tries to spell out that 
exchange. Um, the other thing to point out, um, Colin said, uh, if you, as the new organizer, set up your own subscription so that you are now managing the group, you can select the former organizer if they still want to be involved and have a lot of those privileges for managing um, the member list, setting up events, uh, getting access to the statistics for your group, all of those uh, privileges that were part of being an organizer. Um, as the new organizer, you can select them as a member of your leadership team. A co-organizer has, as you can see in this Help Center article, a lot of the same responsibilities and access privileges that the primary organizer does. They can adjust leadership team members, they can access the group settings, they can remove or ban members, they can view attendance history, they can use the communication tools, meaning they can send emails from your group, um, and they can obviously schedule events. So if the former organizer cannot pay their subscription and you take it over, they can still be deeply involved in the management of the group as long as they are still part of the leadership team. So I just want to make sure that those resources are clearly available for everyone. Um, all right, moving Great. on. Question number five. What media are used for meeting events? Zoom, Duo, and others are available. Are any media available directly through Meetup by logging into the Meetup website? Um, this is an interesting question. Um, if you've been with Meetup for a long time, no doubt you remember Meetup used to be exclusively um, dedicated to getting people off of their computers and hosting in-person events. And then during the pandemic, we pivoted. We made sure we were integrating a lot more support for online events. And now it's like a stable part of the ecosystem of Meetup. Some people are meeting in person, some people are meeting online. Although Meetup does not have its own video conferencing service to host the events, we do support uh, a Zoom integration. Uh, if you have a Zoom account, you can set up a pairing with your Meetup account so that in the event scheduler, you just tap a button that says Zoom and it will auto-populate the online event field with a special link for your event. Um, if you prefer not to use Zoom, that online event field is blank and you can manually insert the URL, the link to any third-party video conferencing service. Um, uh, it, it applies to most any video conferencing service. If you run into an error message and you try to insert the link to your preferred video conferencing platform for your online event and the event scheduler is not accepting it, reach out to the community support team. We can investigate. We might be able to uh, make sure that Meetup recognizes that particular video conference, uh, or we might identify some sort of error in the link that you are posting. We'll make sure you can get it set up so that you can host the video conferencing online event that you prefer. Um, feature requests are great ways to request uh, improvements to the video conferencing integration, or if you'd like to see um, like a fully uh, uh, meetup version of, of online event organizing. Um, uh, but make sure that you uh, have access to uh, the help center, as always, because it'll walk you through the process of how to install Zoom on your computer, link it to your meetup account so that you see in this uh, screenshot right here, that's what it's going to look like when you've connected Zoom to your Meetup account. Uh, as you're scheduling a new event, you just tap that Zoom button and that field where it says add link to online event will be auto-populated. Um, all right. Anything you'd like to add there, Colin, about online events? Not really. Yeah, just the only thing was <clears throat> right now we only have an integration for Zoom, but like you said, if you're if you are dying to um, have an easier integration for like Google Meets or other uh, third parties, definitely hit us up with a feature request. Um, we'd love to hear, um, you know, why that would be helpful. But yeah, I can go into question six. All right. So this question is: What are the real differences between standard Meetup and Meetup Pro? So. <clears throat> A couple questions ago, I was talking about standard meetup subscriptions where you have the ability to organize up to three groups with one subscription. 
So you pay and you can just organize three of any you know, category um, with unlimited membership, et cetera. Now Meetup Pro is an elevated version of that. Um, a lot of our pro subscribers um, are either like enterprise companies or businesses or, or just someone who wants to have uh, groups in different areas um, as like a network of groups. Um, and usually that network has that like kind of um, that thread of like, uh, like a same, like a theme, you know, like a, a, you know, for example, Google has a bunch of groups all over the world and Google might have a, a, a pro network where they can uh, have groups in different areas of the world. Um, and then they schedule events in those locations. So, but it doesn't have to be as big as Google. You can have your own little network of whatever you want. So Meetup Pro, you, like I said, you can have a network of more than three groups. Now keep in mind that this is, uh, the, the, pay, the payment is different for Pro. Uh, you are charged per group for this subscription uh, compared to the standard where you pay one subscription and you have three groups. Pro is different, you pay per group. Um, also, you can have access to an analy analytics dashboard so that is a pro dashboard where you can see a bunch of things like um, RSVPs and um, different network events you schedule and membership. Also, um, if members have shared their email address with you, you can uh, see all of that on your members list. So um, do we want to want to give like a preview of the, the pro dashboard, maybe, Alex? I yeah, have, let me um, see if I can get that set up for us. Yeah. Just about. Oh, yeah. Yeah, while you do that, I'll just kind of share a little more. Um, Pro is, like I said, you can collect emails and then you can um, connect a MailChimp um, account to it. And then you can contact all of those members uh, with their email addresses through MailChimp and send you know campaigns of whatever you want. Um, I mentioned network events. Network events is a feature where you schedule one event, but you schedule the same one across different groups. Um, so if you have multiple groups, instead of scheduling it, then individually in each group, you can just schedule one and then say, okay, this is one event for all of these groups um, in my network. Um, another feature that we recently launched is a speaker section in the event scheduler. So when you are scheduling an event, you can say, my event's going to have a speaker, and then you can add um, who the speaker is, a little photo, little bio of them. Um, and it will show on the event page of who this person is. Yeah, so those are some uh, main features uh, for Meetup Pro. This, thank you, Alex, this is the analytics uh, or Pro dashboard where this page has network analytics. You can see the, the total membership, total events you've hosted, total RSVPs, and then like the growth over time. Um, if you go to the groups tab, <clears throat> You can see all of the groups in your network. These are just random, uh, you know, test groups that we have. But um, you can see if you you are the organizer or not, total membership. So just like this an overview, a lot of filtering at the top as well. If you go to the members tab, yeah. So we'll see this one. Yeah, this one. <clears throat> there might be some email addresses um, that. Now, email addresses only appear when the member agrees to share it with you, but it's a great way to collect um, them and then, you know, use MailChimp to contact them and events and network events. So a lot of uh, additional tools for Meetup Pro organizers. Also, you can create templates so you can quickly uh, create events without redoing it every time. It's just an automatic, automatically generated template with, um, you know, uh, title, description, and other features. So yeah. Um, if you'd like a, a of, chance to play yeah. with um, templates, it's worth checking out the meet and greet event template, which is available for all standard subscribers. Um, it's right in the event homepage. If you click use this template, it'll auto-populate a cover photo and an event description and a title for you. So all you have to end up filling out is the date and time and the location of your event. Uh, templates can save you a lot of time and a lot of headaches in the actual planning of an event. 
Uh, one of the nice things about the meet and greet available for standard subscribers is it helps attract new members to your group. Um, so just an opportunity to try out that feature, which is more widely available and a lot more flexible for Meetup Pro subscribers. Um, another thing I also wanted to call out too, sorry to interrupt, Colin. Um, no. We were talking before about um, transferring subscriptions here in question four. Um, Pro becomes an interesting way to maybe work around that in some aspects. One of the other opportunities with Pro, this first bullet point we have on the slide, own a network of more than three groups. There's two different kinds of networks you can set up. One is called an ownership network, where you essentially are the primary organizer for all the groups in your network. The other one is a sponsored network, which means other people can run the group. Um, and the network is sort of paying that uh, local organizer to run the group on behalf of the network. Um, so uh, yeah, essentially this, it, it does boil down to like whoever paid for the subscription is the one who has the most access and privileges to manage the group or the pro network. But there's a little bit more flexibility with who pays and what access you have when you get uh, Meetup Pro. So uh, yeah. if you are interested uh, in giving Meetup Pro a try, you can just go to meetup.com slash pro. It'll direct you to a landing page where you can sign up for a free trial. I think it goes for 30 days. And then the number of groups that you have uh, dictates the monthly or six month cost per group of your subscription. Right, yeah. Um, moving right along to question number seven. Um, this is a really common question that we get, um, which is, it seems like my members aren't getting emails from Meetup. Uh, how can I make sure that they're getting emails again? Um, trusting our communication tools is absolutely vital for building healthy community with Meetup. Um, so we're working really hard to make sure that all of our organizers understand what notifications are expected to go out, who's expecting to receive them, and what choices are at the hands of your members to control what messages they are in fact receiving. Many times your members have just adjusted their notifications to receive fewer ones because people do get a lot of notifications through Meetup. We're trying to streamline that and make it more efficient so that people are getting the notifications that matter most to them. Um, so there's a few help center articles that it might be helpful to familiarize yourself with. One of them is, why am I not receiving Meetup emails? This gives you a lot of the most common reasons why you might not be receiving emails. Some of them, it's about where you've decided to receive those notifications to your mobile device or to your email account. Um, some of them, you can change the notifications for specific groups that you are in, and people forget that they've done that. If you're not receiving any emails, it's possible that your email handler has started blocking Meetup, so you might want to check your spam filters. But for my money, I think the most useful thing to keep in mind as an organizer is it's actually not your responsibility as the organizer to ensure that they are receiving those notifications, it's ours, your community support team and the product team here at Meetup. The resource that's really useful to have as an organizer is a link to the Help Center support ticketing system that creates an email for our, uh, our customer support specialists to investigate an answer. We work directly with members, we check out their account, see if anything's gone wrong, we make sure that they're getting the emails that they're supposed to get. Um, there's also an article that might be of interest, which is what notifications should I be receiving? Just wanna show people what that one looks like. So this breaks it down in a table and also breaks it down by notifications that organizers receive versus notifications that your members expect to receive. We try to break down what kind of notifications, where they can expect to receive them, and how often. Um, so uh, another useful resource available in the Help Center for you. Um, so again, uh, headline here I would like to stress is make sure that you have a quick and easy link to share with your members if something goes wrong with their emails or with anything else that's going wrong with like their app or something. 
Um, I know it's stressful as an organizer. I've experienced this myself. It is stressful as an organizer if somebody reports to you, they're having trouble using Meetup and therefore being part of your community. If that happens, please, please, please encourage them to contact community support. That's how we investigate. That's how we improve Meetup. That's how we make sure everything's working as smoothly as possible for you, the organizers. Um, all right. It is uh, pretty close to 12.35, Great. I think we're ready to jump into the Q&As that we've been getting in our Q&A. Yeah, I see a bunch of questions. Thank you all for uh, asking your questions in the Q&A feature. Um, I have a couple here that I can answer live. Um, the first question is from Dominic. Hello, how can I get my event to show up as a suggested event in the events list of other members? Okay, um, Alex, I'm gonna take over screen sharing if it's okay. Yeah, go for it. I will share my screen. Okay. So I believe Dominic is referring to when you go to your homepage. Um, I see my upcoming events here. Um, but I can toggle suggested events on um, so that some some of the events are, you can see, suggested uh, that are the algorithm in, in the back end of our system uh, suggests to me because I may be interested. So right here is a suggested event. And I see that um, it's about coffee. This one is about tech. Uh, and this these suggestions I believe are based on the interests that I have chosen um, for uh, for my profile. And it's uh, based on your location. So I'm in New York. So, so you know, these are probably in my area. And then um, I may have chosen in my interests, like I think I chose like food and drink or something. So coffee comes up. I think I also chose tech or like computer. I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, that's the idea is like, it kind of shows you suggested events. So this question is how to get his events to show up. And I think the answer is a little tricky because it really comes down to the members interests and location. So our algorithm takes into account what your event is about. So make sure to um, add as many interests or sorry, as many topics to your group as possible. Um, and add topics about uh, in your event when you're scheduling it and make sure to include uh, some details, detailed like keywords that you think people would be interested in in your event title and description, just so that our algorithm and our, our system can pick up on those words and then say, okay, this is likely, uh, uh, this is something that we think um, this member in particular would be interested in. So we're gonna suggest it to them. So that's the best advice I can give. Um, um, there's not like a direct way to do that, um, but just um, hopefully that'll that'll help. I think also if I'm looking in the search, I'm not sure if there's a suggested. Yeah, I think the relevance, um, you know, when you do a regular search um, and you sort by relevance, like the relevance does, uh, bases it based on like location and and keywords so anyway hopefully that helps let's go to the next question yeah next question comes from mike mike asks i'm already an organizer how do i increase my participation at my live events this is a great question it's a huge part of being an organizer how do you actually get people to turn up we have been hosting uh, a few meetup live events over the last few weeks specifically around the idea of engagement some of the highlights that I can point out are, uh, first of all, making sure that your group title, your group description, and your event titles have the major keywords of what your group is about. Uh, Colin just searched for running. So making sure that if you have a running group, um, rather than having a group that's like named after a nickname of your group make sure that you have like running or jogging or whatever the specific focus of your group is uh, a lot of our search engine works around those keywords so making sure that it's easy to search for your groups big way to attract 
members to finding your stuff. Uh, number two, making sure that you have regularly scheduled events. Um, and I don't mean recurring events because recurring events are a little um, misleading sometimes. A lot of organizers can set up a recurring event that just keeps recurring forever. And it's not clear if people are actually still attending this event. If a new member joins your group, sees that there's a recurring event and that no one is attending it, that can be a big turnoff. So what I mean by having regularly scheduled events is making sure you have one event that's scheduled in make two weeks and another one in three weeks and another one in five weeks. Just have a handful of individual separately focused events that have some attention already around them. Make sure that your existing members who are engaged know that these events are coming up and that they RSVP to them. Um, we've seen a lot of statistics around uh, people, new members, feeling a lot more motivated to RSVP to events if they see that there's a lot of activity there. Uh, event photos, huge attraction for people joining these events. Um, now, if by participation you're saying, how do I get people to actually show up? Um, what I've been hearing lately from organizers, such as our mentors, who are available in our uh, Meetup organizer community on Discord, we'll talk more about that at the end of our presentation. Uh, some of the mentors have been telling me they find direct messages and regular communications using the contact members tools are really, really huge in making right, sure. Like as a reminder, you can use it as just like, "Hey, looking forward to see you, seeing you later." I use event chat. I use uh, comments, you can right. use the members tool as just like kind of like your own little reminder. Or We or offer a variety of communication tools. Event Chat is the most recent, and the idea behind it is to give you this real-time space to communicate specifically around one event. Um, we offer a, a number of these communication tools so that you can test and see which forms of communication work best for your group. But what I have learned is that the more investment you put into communicating, and I don't mean necessarily following up like, hey, are you going to turn up? Because that can become pressure for people. I mean, gently checking in with people and being, like Colin said, excited to see you is great. Uh, one of the mentors even said, if you have RSVP'd and you know you're not going to make it, would you please change your RSVP? No hard feelings. Just want to make sure I have an accurate head count. That lets people feel a lot more comfortable about changing their RSVP, giving you an accurate headcount. And then if they did change to not going for that particular event, they're that much more likely to then attend in the future because they felt welcomed, that it was safe for them to change their RSVP. So- um, Alex, we should share, because you just did a Meetup 101 last week. It's the title was from RSVP to attending or to show ups. And uh, I think we should share the link for people to watch the recording. I'm not sure if Emily has it on hand, but um, love to share that because it's it was uh, two of our mentors who joined Alex kind of talk about how, like good strategies around getting people to participate and actually show up, you know, because one thing to RSVP, it's another to actually attend. So right. um, if if uh, I'll I'll try to find it, but oh, there, there it, it is. is. Emily's just posted. Emily. It's a recent blog article that includes a recording of that event. Um, yeah. If you, if you have more questions about boosting participation, engagement, making sure that your RSVPs actually show up, strongly recommend that, uh, that yeah. Emily just posted. Um, so we're at time and uh, we have, we've gotten a few more questions, but um, we will save them for our next office hours, which we will do next month. Um, so thank you so much for everyone for submitting them. Um, and yeah, really appreciate um, you all. Let's make sure that we've got some resources live for people. Um, <clears throat> who uh, would like to make sure that they can contact us on the support team. Um, first of all, uh, we walked you through the feature request form. If you scan the QR code on the top left corner, you will have access to submit your own feature requests. If you don't have suggestions for additional features, but you just want to stay up to date on what is getting launched on Meetup, what is available on the website or on the apps, the bottom left-hand corner QR code will take you to uh, the product updates in our Community Matters blog. I've been trying to share a lot of links with our help center 
Um, we try to make sure that as many resources are possible as possible are available for organizers and members who are navigating and using Meetup. Um, hopefully, a lot of the answers you're looking for are available in the Help Center. Um, and if something's gone wrong, if you encounter an error message or something is working in a way that you don't think it's supposed to be, please submit a bug report. The bottom right hand corner will create a ticket for our team who investigates bugs and errors on Meetup. If you submit there, we're able to investigate a lot more efficiently, a lot more quickly. We can roll out fixes more efficiently and quickly. Um, I mentioned the organizer community on Discord. Uh, this is a rapidly growing community. We're really proud of it. It launched last year. We have a team of organizer mentors. These are seasoned, experienced organizers with thriving groups who share their experiences and their tips for how they are managing their groups. We have uh, new organizers joining all the time, sharing their experiences. If you'd like to scan this QR code, you'll get set up uh, on Discord, which if you're not familiar with it, is an instant messaging platform. If you don't have an account already, you'll have to create one, but you'll have access to this wealth of information and community uh, specifically around community building that we're really, really happy to be hosting. Um, and last but not least, we have the Keep Connected podcast with our CEO, David Siegel. We host interviews. We tease upcoming uh, features and events and thoughts about where Meetup is heading. You can subscribe to this podcast uh, by scanning the QR code. Uh, at the beginning of the year, I believe we had an interview with singer-songwriter Jewel, which was quite exciting. <laughs> uh, so please uh, feel free to subscribe, and uh, we will see you at our next Meetup Live event. Thank you so much for submitting your questions. Uh, we hope these office hours were useful for were useful for you, and we will be doing these again. Yes, um, thank you so much, everyone. Take care. <laughs>